Hi everyone and welcome to this Working Class Writers Festival event in collaboration with Bristol Ideas Festival with Val McDermott. My name is Sean Norris, I'm the Chief Social Affairs Reporter at the Byline Times and I also set up the Bristol Women's Literature Festival. Before I introduce Val, just to do some housekeeping, this is a pre-recorded event so we won't be taking questions at the end from the audience but please do leave comments in the chat and share your thoughts and reflections on the event. And if you want to follow both the Working Class Writers Festival and Bristol Ideas on social media, you can get more information about upcoming talks as part of the festival and also please sign up to the Bristol Ideas newsletter. So Val McDermott really doesn't need any introduction, but I'm going to do one anyway. She's been dubbed the Queen of Crime and has sold over 17 million books to date across the world and is translated into more than 40 languages. She is perhaps best known for her Wire in the Blood series, which featured clinical psychologist Dr. Tony Hill and DCI Carol Jordan. And you may have seen it on a TV starring Robson Green and Hermione Norris. She's also written three other series featuring private detective Kate Brannigan, journalist Lindsay Gordon, and most recently cold case detective Karen Peary, whose debut appearance in The Distant Echo is seen to become another major TV series. As well as the series, she's published many award-winning standalone novels, books of non-fiction, short story collections, and a children's picture book called My Granny is a Pirate. And as well as talking about her career, her inspirations, her ideas, we'll also be talking about the latest novel, 1979, which features the journalist Ali Burns, and which if you haven't read it yet, I urge you to buy it from our partners at Storysmith Booksellers because it's really fantastic. I had very many late nights because I just couldn't put it down. So thank you Val, if we were in a room everyone would clap now, but <laughs> so we'll just do it here. But yeah, thank you so much for coming and for being part of the festival. I've got so many questions that I want to ask you and so many issues that I want to discuss, but I thought it'd be good if we started at the beginning, you know, and talked a little bit about your experience as a reader and a writer. So going back in time to when you were a child, even before 1979 even, um, were you a big reader and did you write stories? I mean, what kind of got you into reading and writing? I was a, I was a big reader for, right from the get-go, really, and uh, that was because my mum uh, believed very firmly in the power of education and the power of reading. Both my parents were working class, came from a very working class background. They'd both left school at 14 because hadn't gone to high school because their parents couldn't afford the uniforms. They were bright people who didn't have the opportunities uh, laid out before them that our, our generation had. And they were determined that I would have a better chance at life than they'd had. So even before I could read, my mum used to stick me in the pushchair, wheel me across the council estate to the local library and read me kids' picture books. Um, when I was six years old, we moved house uh, to live opposite the central library in Kirkcaldy, where I grew up. Uh, and that, for me, transformed my life. I had my own library tickets. Uh, and I could go across to the library across the street and borrow books every day, apart from Sunday when it was closed. Uh, and so that, that became my home from home. And I could easily get through two books a day, two novels a day. Uh, but the rules were pretty strict back then. It wasn't like now where you can go into the library and fill your boots. You could only take out four books. And because it was Presbyterian Scotland, two of them had to be nonfiction. Because heaven forfend, you should just have pleasure. Uh, so I read whatever was going, really. Uh, I, I read all around the, the fiction shelves, but I also read a lot of non-fiction. So that would be things like history, natural history, and poetry and drama, for some reason, were considered to be non-fiction. And also things like myth, myths and legends were considered to be non-fiction. So that kind of filled the gap quite a bit when I, I ran out of books to read over a weekend. But in terms of the fiction, I, I look back at it now, and there was nothing that reflected my life. The, everybody was middle class. Uh, you had Enid Blyton's Famous Five, Secret Seven, uh, Mystery Series, all of which I loved, and lots of girls' boarding school stories, which I also loved. But they had no connectivity into my life. So I suppose very early on, I, I formed the idea that fiction was just that. It was fiction. It was a complete other universe. It wasn't, wasn't my life. But the one series of books that uh, really struck a profound chord for me and, and, and did in fact have real influence on my life was the Chalet School books uh, by Eleanor M. Brent Dyer. It's a series of 50 odd books uh, 
set in a girls' boarding school, which starts off life in Switzerland. Uh, and then the Second World War intervenes and they have to decamp to the Channel Islands. And then they go back. To, uh, so it starts in Austria and then they decamp and they end up in Switzerland. So you have this girls' boarding school in, in the Alps with a, a very exotic uh, range of pupils. Uh, and I remember the hysteria around my tea table when I said, why can't I go to a Swiss boarding school? It was completely uh, mad, really. Uh, but, but there were things about those books that really appealed to me. Um, one of them was the fact that they were a proper series. You know, you read things like The Famous Five uh, or, 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 and nothing changes. It's the same sempiternal summer. Nobody gets any older. Nothing that happens to them has any impact. Uh, nobody ever says, don't go into the dark cave alone because remember the last time we went into dark cave, something terrible happened. So they were kind of uh, set in aspic, but the Shally school books moved forward in time. Every book covered a term or a year in the life of the school and events had consequences. Uh, practical consequences, like if you broke a leg in one book, you were still limping three books later, but also uh, personal emotional consequences, relationships develop, changed. And of course, because you don't never get to read things in sequence when you're borrowing them from the library, there were always those marvellous moments of revelation and understanding. Well, that's why she behaves the way she does. So a lot, that, that aspect of them really appealed to me. Um, but there were other practical ways in which they kind of had an influence on me. Uh, everybody who left the Shelley School and went on to further education would go to one of three institutions. They'd either go to the Sorbonne or to Oxford or the Kensington School of Needlework. Now, obviously, I wasn't going to go to the Kensington School of Needlework. But when I decided it was time for me to spread my wings, uh, something that had also been encouraged by the, the reading that I'd done over the years, um, Oxford was the only place I knew about outside Scotland. So that's where I ended up. Uh, and they also shaped my, my professional career because one of the characters in the books grows up to become a writer of children's school stories. And uh, I remember one book, I can, I can picture it now, it was a paragraph on the right-hand page about halfway down she gets a letter from her publisher and inside it is a check. And I thought, you get paid for this. Oh my God, it's a job. And that was the point where I decided that I was going to be a writer. Um, and I think my, my I, didn't, I didn't write stories so much at that point, but I used to tell stories to myself in my head. Uh, I, used to go for, I used to walk for, for hours, miles with the dog. Uh, and I, in, this, in those long dog walks in my head, I would be inhabiting whatever novel I was reading at the time and inserting myself into the story and driving the story in different directions and, and trying out different angles. So that was really where the, the, the storytelling started and in a funny kind of way, it's, it's where the editing started as well. I mean, I think it just highlights the importance of libraries as well, doesn't it? I mean, what you were saying, I remember exactly the same, like the local library at the bottom of the hill where I grew up and you had your pink ticket when you were a kid and then finally you graduated to the grown up ticket, which meant you were allowed to take out a few more books and, and that's how you learn, that's how you discovered reading. And, you know, obviously we're in this situation where the libraries are disappearing and I mean, what impact do you think that that's gonna have on future reading and future writing? I think it's gonna have a terrible impact uh, because, for so many people, libraries are the source of information on the world, not just reading fiction, but, but reading the non-fiction. Also, our library had various magazines that you could read. It had reference works that you could consult. It was a place where you could find out about the world. Uh, and I mean, now libraries are so much more than just places to borrow books. They have internet connections. They have meeting groups, that, all sorts of things from from book groups through to mother and toddler groups to jigsaw groups to, to um, board game groups. They're where people can come together and combat loneliness and isolation, as well as actually being a, a source of, of knowledge and information and food for the imagination. And if we stop creating readers, it's not just writers we stop creating. We stop creating all sorts of people. So many different worlds open up in a library. And whatever your interest, whatever piques your, your interest, you will find fuel for it there. And that's what makes the future doctors, teachers, nurses, firefighters, architects, musicians, writers. We all find possibilities in libraries. 
And there's something else about having public space, I think, which is so important in a library. The library that I mentioned is now a cafe. So if you want to go, you, it's not a library anyway, it's called the library, but it's it's a cafe. And so it's somewhere where you have to pay to be where you, you know, you're you can't just go in and and yeah, find those meeting spaces, find those books, find those adventures. And yeah, this kind of shift from public to private space in terms of access is quite concerning. Yeah, I think that's really that's really is worrying. Um, the, the library where I, I went growing up is now called Kirkcaldy Galleries because it's amalgamated with the museum next door. And there is a cafe in the building, but there are still places where you can go and sit and read. Uh, so they've, they've managed, I think, to, to bridge that, uh, that difficult uh, problem between the private and public space. So you still have the public space, but you can sit and have a cup of coffee if you want to sit down and have a cup of coffee while you're reading or meeting your friends. Uh, and in a sense, I'm, I'm quite happy that that brings more people into the environment of the library and the, and the museum, which is a very good museum. So, I mean, I think that in many respects, that's the kind of model we should, should move towards. And one of the things I have been encouraged by in, in recent years is the development of uh, shopping centres with libraries inside them, uh, local councils with the, the ambition and, and the, the vision to say, if you want to build a shopping mall or if you want to build your new weight roast or whatever, you have to put a library in there. And that's the way we should be thinking and that's the way we should be doing things. Uh, it should be, if, if the local authority hasn't got the money to do things, then that's where it's appropriate to do these public-private kind of partnerships. But the libraries are so important and it feels to me that what's happening at the moment is burning the seed corn. It's not yeah. levelling up, it's keeping us in our place. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you grew up in, in Kirkcaldy and then went to Oxford and then became a, a journalist. Is that right? You, yeah. you went into journalism and obviously 1979, the new novel is, is really set in, in a newspaper in Scotland. It's very, you really get a sense of the print and the, the machines working in the kind of the grubbiness and the cigarettes and just so many cigarettes. It's so weird to think that you used to be able to smoke in an office. Um, but I wanted, how much did you lean on your own experience as a journalist um, to, to go back in time to re-inhabit that space and, and start writing the novel? I drew very much on my, my memories of that world. Um, I'd, I'd say very firmly, Ali Burns is not me. Um, you know, if I was writing my 1979 novel, it would be very different. Uh, I was young, free and single and enjoying myself. Um, but uh, I, I, the anecdotage is largely mine and, and that of people that I, I worked beside. So I'm drawing on those, those memories of, of newsroom life. And that's what it was like. You know, people didn't just uh, smoke in the office. People smoked over their dinner. You know, you'd be sitting in the restaurant having a meal and that person sitting next to you would be having a fag. It was, it was extraordinary. The, looking back at it now, it just seems so utterly bizarre. Uh, I guess we all spent much of our lives in a miasma of cigarette smoke. Um, I mean, as you say, I think it's always that question that women writers get asked, like, is it you, is it you? And of course it's not. It's a work of fiction. It's, it's an act of fiction. But I mean, what was the, how did you kind of approach the research in terms of thinking about like newsrooms in the 70s and, and the sort of, I mean, did you go back to archives or was it really sort of thinking about memories? And Well, my, my research was extremely limited. The, the possibilities were extremely limited because I wrote this book in lockdown. Uh, and so I, I, I couldn't get access to initially to some of the things that I, I really needed. Uh, I, I read I read the fiction that had been published around that time. Uh, so I read quite a few novels from 1978, 79 to get a sense of uh, the world as people were describing it at the time. Um, and I listened to music from the time. And music's fantastic because music's a time machine. Everybody has has musical memories, you know, and, and sometimes they come upon you in the most uh, bizarre circumstances. You know, these days, so many shops, you, went to, you go into the supermarket and they're playing, you know, supermarket radio and suddenly a song comes out of your past and attacks you by the, by the, by the cold cuts counter, you know. Uh, and, and we've all got those, those instant flip back to when we heard that song, what club we were in when we were dancing to, who we were going out with, who broke your heart, uh, when your kids started school, what you were doing with your life at that time. And it comes right back with the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, is, is a very powerful medium, the music. So I was, I was while I was working on getting the, the shape of the book in my head and, and getting my ideas about 
whose book it was and whose story it was. I was listening to a lot of, of music from the time. And in fact, there is a, a sort of playlist of 40 tracks at the end of the book that uh, people can listen to to get them in the mood uh, for, for what's, what's in the story. Um, so that was, there was that as well. Uh, I also had uh, my own memories, obviously. Uh, but ultimately, what I needed was to get into the newspaper archives uh, because you, you read the history books and the reference books and they tell you the big events that were going on. They tell you the national things, the big international events, uh, and that jogs certain elements of memory. But the thing about newspapers is that they, they cover the human interest stories, if you like, the things that we all talk about in the canteen or in the bus queue or you know, over dinner with our friends, whatever, in the pub. Uh, those are the stories that you find in the newspapers that don't make it into the history books. Uh, and you also find lots of useful information, like how much was a blouse at CNAs in the sale? Uh, what were people wearing? You know, um, what was the furniture like? How much did a three-piece suite cost? Uh, what, what, what laggers were available in the supermarket? How much were they? All of those things. What was on at the pictures? What was on the TV? because it's so often our memory can play tricks on us about those kind of details. And the newspaper is where I, I've always researched recent history when I've, I've used sort of split timeframes in, in books. So I couldn't get to the newspaper archives because of lockdown for quite a while. Uh, so there was, there was quite a few bits in play, in the, as I was going through, as I started to write, but the sort of question marks, you know, the things I had to check out. And as soon as I was able to get into the, the National Library of Scotland again, after the lockdown eased, uh, I, I, last summer I was in, in like Flynn uh, and working my way through bound volumes of uh, the Daily Record and microfiche copies of the Glasgow Herald, uh, refreshing my memories about things that happened then. And the weirdest thing of all was, was coming up against stories with my byline on that I had no recollection of having written. And that's a very weird feeling. Uh, you know, so you'd, you'd look at the story and think, I don't remember doing that. I don't remember being there. But uh, it did it did awaken lots of other recollections of the time about life in the office and about the kind of um, conversations that you had around the stories you wanted to do and the stories you were allowed to do, which were often two very different things when you were a woman. I mean, that's something that really shines through in the in the novel. This this sort of the, the shuffling of women towards, as you say, human interests or the sort of, I don't want to say fluffy because human interest can be really serious and, and real, but that kind of battle for recognition and that battle to be taken seriously. And obviously these are still issues that we're grappling with today. I mean, do you see fiction as a way to kind of explore um, political issues or social issues that might be kind of, you know, obviously another aspect of the novel is the conversations about independence and devolution like are these a, a novel spaces where you can ask these political questions i think if you're writing fiction uh it's important to have a sense of authenticity about the world you're creating and for me that means creating a picture of a wider world outside just the hermetic lives of, of the characters and the great joy of crime fiction is that it's not a hermetic kind of fiction. You can write the sort of tiny enclosed, it's a village mystery or there's six people on an island or whatever mystery. But in general, if you're writing fiction set in, in a contemporary setting in, in a town or a city or even a rural setting, you're going to be dealing with a wide range of people uh, and you're going to be dealing with a wide range of circumstances. And that allows me to, to write about what I see in the society around me. Uh, and I think that I think a crime novel has become the novel of social history. It's where we write about different aspects of the society that we live in. And in the way that, you know, when people want to know what life was like in Victorian England, they go to Dickens um, or they go to Mrs. Gaskell. I think in a hundred years time, people will be looking to the crime novel to find how people actually lived uh, because it does cover a, a huge social range. Uh, so, because you've got, for, you've got the victim, and their relationships, their workplace, their, their family, their friends. Uh, you've got the witnesses who can be very different from different social strata, different environments. You've got the police who have their own particular little world. You've got the media who cover it. You've got the forensic scientists involved. So you've got all these possibilities to take the story in different directions and, and look at different aspects of, of modern life. And I think that 
um, you know, I look around at my fellow crime writers and I see a lot of different perspectives on the world that we live in. And I think that's fascinating and exciting. Um, it's not just a, anymore. It's not just a middle class enclave in St Mary Mead. Uh, people are writing about all sorts of things. They're writing about the lives of immigrants and refugees. They write about the lives of, of people at the bottom of the pile as well as at the top of the pile and everything in between. And that to me is one of the great excitements about writing this genre. And it's something that has changed dramatically in my writing life. Uh, when I started out, the crime novel essentially still was that, that very um, south of England, uh, middle class thing. It was, it was, it was, uh, it was police procedurals, uh, but but um, quite um, nice police procedurals, if you like. It was Colin Dexter. It wasn't Derek Raymond so much, um, and and it was it was it was still the village mystery. Now I've not, I, I I think some of these novels are excellent, beautifully written, well put together. I still go back to them, but an awful lot of them were just shoring up uh, a status quo that that almost didn't exist anymore. Uh, and I came along at a time when uh, writers with a different perspective were starting to use the crime novel as a way to express themselves because there wasn't really a home for us in, in mainstream literary fiction. Um, so for me, one of the, the key jumping off points was William McIlvanny's novel, Laidlaw, uh, which came out in 78 and was set in Glasgow and set very much in the working class life of Glasgow. And I'd never read a book like this before. I certainly never read a crime novel like this before. This was this was the lives of, of, of people who were living difficult, sometimes desperate lives at the bottom of the pile. Um, and McIlvanny gave them the language of the streets. It was it was the speech I heard in my daily working life in Glasgow. It was how people talked to each other. It was how people interconnected, how they related to each other. Um, but set against that was McIlvanny's beautiful prose style when he was describing their environment and he was talking about the lives they led as opposed to listening to the voices they used to speak with. And I was blown away by this. I'd never read anything quite like it. And it started to make me think about the kind of books I might want to write. But I, was, I, I didn't have the confidence, if you like, to, to go down that, that road right away. It sort of gave me permission, but I needed something else because Frankly, in, in the, the, the world of, of uh, McIlvanny's fiction, like so much Scottish fiction at the time written by men, uh, women were either Madonnas or whores, basically. And I saw myself as a slightly more complex person than that. Uh, and I wanted to write slightly more complex people than that. And the, the, the book that finally uh, got me off my backside and, and doing rather than thinking about it was Sarah Paretsky's first novel, Indemnity Only which features V.I. Warshawski, who is a, a Chicago-based female private eye. Uh, she comes from a, a working class background herself, uh, and she has agency. She has a brain and a sense of humor, and she doesn't need the guys to come along and save her. She's quite capable of saving herself and doing the job that she's required to do. And I was, I was again, I was entranced by this. But what I also loved about that book was that, like Michael Vanny, it, it's set very specifically in terms of place. Uh, and there's a real sense of what the city is really like, how people live their lives, the jobs they do. And it felt very particular to that place. It felt almost as if this book couldn't have happened anywhere else in those terms. And that the combination of those two books really excited me. And I thought, this is the kind of book I want to write. Maybe one day, if I try really, really hard, I'll be able to aspire to something like that. And so that's what got me started. But it was very much a sense of, um, I think we all need, we all kind of need at some level, we kind of need permission to do what we're doing. And with, with all these kind of movements in, in literature, all these changes that happen, one, one or two people kick the door open a crack and show the possibilities to the rest of us. You know, and, and, and with McIlvanny, um, you know, he kicked the door open a bit and then Ian Rankin and I pushed it open a bit wider. And then a vast flood of Scottish crime writers has followed us. And with, with Sarah Paretsky, she was one of a, a group of women around that time who'd started writing these female private eye novels. You had, um, you had Sarah, you had Sue Grafton, you had Marsha Muller, you had Barbara Wilson, you had Mary Wings. And that, again, opened a different kind of door 
Here were women writing with lesbian protagonists or with, with straight women who took an active role in their lives and didn't just defer to men. And, and, and I thought, this is, this is exciting. This is pos full of possibility. And if, if those two books hadn't come along into my life when they did, I don't know that I would have jumped in at the point that I did. And I probably wouldn't have had the career that I have because when I wrote my first book, Report for Murder, which was published by the Women's Press, um, writers like Sarah Paretsky and Sue Grafton had started to make an impact in the UK and publishers were keen to have something similar with a British setting. Uh, and I came along with, with Lindsay Gordon at just the right moment. I had the right book in the right place at the right time. Five years earlier, no one would have been interested. Five years later, the market would have been saturated. So I, I, I bless my, my, my four parents uh, there because that started me at a time when I could find a space for my book to be published. And I'll say the joy of the women's press, right? I mean, it was so important to have those kind of houses opening doors for women writers and, and for readers. Like when I was a teenager, if I saw that black and white spine and I bought it, I didn't really care what it was about. You just find out and hope for the best and creating those spaces for different voices. And as you say, kicking the door open is so important that we have that. Yeah, and, and one of the great delights in, in the last few years has been the, the growth of indie presses, uh, again, giving voice to, to people who don't somehow fit in or have access to the conventional routes to publication by, uh, by bigger commercial publishers. Uh, certainly back in the days when uh, I wrote a report for murder, there's, there's no question that a, a, a mainstream publishing house would have published a lesbian crime novel. It just wouldn't have happened. Um, and of course, the, 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 one, the downside of, of um, being published by the women's press at that point was that they published paperback originals and the newspapers did not review paperbacks. I know it's, it's probably hard for people to believe this, but back in the early 1980s, mid 1980s, right through the 1980s into the 90s, paperbacks were not reviewed in the papers at all. So when my novel came out, it didn't get a single review. Uh, it amazes me that it's, it's stayed in print constantly since 1987. And that's mostly been uh, word of mouth and booksellers pressing it into the hands of customers and women talking to each other saying, I've just read this book, I really enjoyed it, I think you'd like it. And that's, that's what built my early career was, was that word of mouth and that community of, of women readers passing it round and, and passing it on and lovely, lovely booksellers. Yeah, booksellers and libraries are so important in terms yeah. of getting things out there. And, you know, they've had such a tough time, obviously, booksellers in lockdown. And mm. you know, we really need to support our local bookshops because that's Absolutely. Yeah, even just walking um, in and seeing, like I say, seeing the spines. That's how you find things. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was it was possible uh, to, to find the books, not always in mainstream bookshops, but there were, there were also little indie bookshops back then as well, like Silver Moon on Charing Cross Road. Um, and but you could go on and, and search out the books that you loved. And then towards the, the middle of the 90s, uh, Waterstones, in its early incarnation, was very much, uh, the stock was always down to individual managers, some of whom were really adventurous in the, the range of stock that they, they chose to put on the shelves and stocked a lot of LGBT literature at that time. So it, it was something that grew gradually over time, but uh, certainly... When I was setting out, it, it all felt very new and very exciting and, and very scary as well. You know, God, there's this world of, of books out there. Is anybody going to buy my book? Uh, and, and I remember certainly in the, the few uh, gigs that I got in early days, sort of for libraries or, or the very few book festivals that were in those days, I always felt that I was kind of there as the spare wheel to make up the numbers. Um, you know, who is this, who is this strange woman here um, with, her, with her lesbian novels? Um, there was always that sense of being an outsider and that was partly class and it was partly what I was right, choosing to write about. I mean that's an issue isn't it this kind of sense of being an outsider in, in both like sexuality and class and and coming from Scotland and like the sort of north-south divide that we still have with literature or just like the London everywhere else mm. divide that we still have. I mean do you think that you sort of mentioned how like when you read Ludlow and, and stuff you you, you saw the language of, that you recognised, the spaces that you recognised, and, and this was opening doors up to, to a different kind of writing and a different kind of storytelling. I mean, do you worry that we're going backwards in any way in terms of 
visibility of class or opening opportunities for working class writers? I think it's difficult because I think one of the, 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 the problems that's always been there is that we don't know the levers to pull. We don't know how to do it. We don't know where to go. We don't know who to talk to. We don't have easy access into those worlds. In some ways, it's e slightly easier now. You have, you have organisations like the Scottish Book Trust who, who set up points of contact between writers and agents and publishers. Um, and you have courses like the ones run by, by Arvin and, and Moniak Gore that, that help people understand the routes to publication. But it's still not easy, I think, to find a contact, to find a way in. I mean, for me, my early writing career, I, I don't think it opened, particularly opened doors for me, but for, from friends of friends I had from, from university days, I, I knew someone to put the book in the hands of. I knew someone at second hand, as it were, who worked at the Women's Press. She wasn't, an, she wasn't an editor. She wasn't going to be editing my book, but I knew, knew to put the book in her hands that she could give it to somebody who did know what they were doing. But other than that, I had no understanding at all if, if the women's press had said, no, sod off, go away, I would have had no idea how to, how to progress from there, apart from just sending out letters blind to, to people. And I didn't have an agent for my first novel, because again, I, I didn't really know how you, you got an agent. I mean, um, I'd had an agent very early on. I'd had early success with, with writing for the theatre, which I, I couldn't replicate. Um, and I'd been told to invite an agent along to see the play, and that's how I got it. But as far as getting an agent for a book was concerned, I just had no idea how, how to go about this. Um, so I think those, those, that sense of having access to the levers of power in, in the world of publishing and, and broadcasting and getting into the theatre are still problematic if you come from a working class background. Where do you even start? And where do you even get the confidence to think I've written a book as opposed to I have many words on a page I don't know if it's a book. Absolutely. And I also think it's that you don't know what you don't know. Like, how, are you, how do you yeah. even know what the process is? Because there's no way of knowing that process until someone tells you. And then it's such a catch-22. But as you say, there's really brilliant initiatives like Arvin and the Scottish Book Trust that are doing that great work in terms of opening doors. And also this, the Working Class Writers Festival, Absolutely. which is saying, number yeah. one, we exist, which is important. Yeah, yeah, I think, I, I think so. And I think what's also important uh, is, is that there is somebody somewhere in your life that says, this is good, this is worth pursuing. Um, you know, I had a very good English teacher when I was at school who really encouraged me to write, uh, who thought I had something that was... Uh, uh, a bit special and 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 he was very supportive and uh actually remained a friend and, and right through life until he, he died a few years ago um i'm still friends with his his widow and his family um you know i was at his, his widow's 90th birthday party recently and that that just that early support someone to say you can do this is hugely important because everybody else in my life was just laughing at me you know um, I, I, when I said I want to be a writer, people just laughed. Um, my parents were sort of in, 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 smiled indulgently. But they said, you have to have a proper job. You can't just be a writer. Um, and everybody else just laughed at me. I mean, it was, my friends laughed at me. Uh, it was my family laughed at me. So they just thought this was a, a ridiculous uh, ambition. The pe people like us don't be writers. Uh, but but because, because Wilf, my, my teacher, did sort of believe that I had uh, a talent he encouraged me and that that encouragement was really what I needed at that point. And other people subsequently sort of came came on board, as it were, and, and said, you need to be doing this and you need to be working on it more rigorously. And But it was that early encouragement that that, uh, that helped me along. And I think that uh, it's something that needs to kind of start with, with schools because for an awful lot of people, that you're writing stuff and you're writing to show it to people because the you know, because the fear of ridicule, the fear of failure is is strong and it's powerful. Um, you know, the fear of failure never goes away. I still finish every book with a, a, a pervasive sense of self doubt that this is not as good as I wanted it to be. Uh, it's not as it, it doesn't meet the ambition I started out with, uh, and each book is in that sense a failure for me. Uh, and 
the spur of that is to try and make the next book better. It's encouraging to know that after 17 million books that that self-doubt still exists. And as oh, yeah. you say, that's what is the spur to make everyone better and better and to keep honing and trying and, and doing the best work. Yeah, I'm always slightly uncomfortable when people say, I'm really pleased with my new book. I kind of think, well, you're not doing it right. Because <laughs> none of us writes the perfect novel. I remember many years ago, Reginald Hill saying, you know, he said, when you start a novel, you sit down with this platonic ideal of the perfect book in front of you. This is, this is going to be the one where the characters are vivid and engaging and your readers fall in love with them and the story flows smoothly without a hiccup or a stumble and the prose is, is marvellous and, and vivid and, and engaging and, 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 and summons up an entire world. So and then every sentence you put on the page takes you further away from that ideal. And it's true. There's, there is that sense of, of you have this idea in your head of, of what the book is going to be and then you start writing it and it's not going to be there. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about going back to sort of 1979 and the journalism aspect. Um, did you find that fiction was a way to, to tell stories that maybe you couldn't explore in journalism or to kind of take threads of ideas or, or, or things that you knew were happening in society and and pursue them through fiction and try and work things out around that. And I'm particularly interested as well in, in there's been a lot of conversation around crime writing and violence against women. And there was some controversy a few years ago about you know, the, whether the portrayals of violence against women in crime was gratuitous or whether it was showing the reality that women go through. And I, I just think, it, is it a way for you to, to explore those things that aren't talked about and are hidden? and particularly around what happens to women? I think that's very much the case. Uh, you know, uh, people sort of say, oh, why do you write books about violence against women? So because violence against women is, is pervasive. It's all pervasive. We've seen recently that the protests about what happened to Sarah Everard, which was just awful. And, but every single week, women in this country die at the hands of their partners or their ex-partners. People they have loved and trusted have taken their lives. Uh, hideous violence, sexual violence, and just random violence is perpetrated against women every single day in this country. And when that stops happening, I'll stop writing about it. The reality of what violence is and what it does is something we need to, to, to talk about. Uh, crime fiction shouldn't be cosy. It shouldn't be a parlor game that, uh, where, where people get murdered off stage as a, as a piece of entertainment. Yes, the novels have to be entertaining in the sense that people have to want to read them, have to engage with the characters, have to enjoy entering their world. But I think if you're writing about sudden violent death, it's, it's, it's incumbent upon you to treat that with a degree of seriousness. And in the Tony Hill and Carol Jordan novels, I deal very directly with the nature of violence and how it contaminates everybody who comes into contact with it. And that's a particular strand of my work. And when I'm writing those books, I spend a lot of time thinking very carefully about how specifically I write about that violence, how specifically I generate that fear. And I'm try to be very careful not to be gratuitous about it. I certainly don't um, approach it with any sense of glee or delight. Uh, and for me, it's, it's whenever I write one of those scenes, it's a very careful uh, looking at it sentence by sentence, word by word. Is that the right adjective? Have I said too much? Have I not said enough? I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm thinking very carefully about the way in which I write these scenes. And in fact, what I'm trying to do is to to set a hair running in the mind of the reader so their imagination fills in the bits I've left out, as it were. Um, and I think it's quite interesting that some of the, the things that people sort of talk to me about, they come and talk to me about my books, the things that shock them and, and, and upset them sometimes, are things where I've only written a couple of sentences. There's a, a scene, for example, in, in the book, The Wire and the Blood, which many people have, have spoken to me about, said how shocking they found it, how awful it was, and, and how, how, how it upset them. It's one paragraph. It's one paragraph, but it's what your head does with that one paragraph. And that's, that's what, what you're doing all the time as a writer. You're trying to say a little bit that makes your reader think a lot, and not just about, about the violence, but about all, all the different aspects that you're writing about. There's, there's that sense of, of trying to, to make it... Um, 
make it vivid in their heads. And yes, it is possible to write about things in fiction that you can't deal with uh, in, in any other way. Um, uh, all, for all sorts of reasons, sometimes because um, it would be invading other people's privacy to write about them, sometimes because you just can't get it in the paper. And that happened to me with a few stories. There are a few occasions where I have used something that uh, I couldn't get away in the paper because the lawyers knocked it on the head or because there was a, a final, a final um, brick in the wall that was missing. And uh, I've, I've used it in fiction. Uh, and there's one, one instance where I, I worked uh, on an investigation for about six months with a team of female freelance journalists. Uh, and at the end, we fell at the final hurdle because the, the newspaper lawyers refused to let us run the story because the people that we were putting in the frame were doctors. Uh, and the re reaction from the, the legal department was they will sue. Uh, and we'll, be, we'll have six doctors suing us and they'll be supported by their, their union and it will be a nightmare uh, and we're not doing it. And uh, that, was, uh, that was a story that I later used part of in, in the novel. Um, so yeah, it, it's, there's all sorts of reasons why you can't uh, publish things. Sometimes it's, it's, it is, and often it is the law of libel, because you have to be very sure of the facts. Um, and I mean, I, I know that uh, I've, I've, I've talked about, uh, about Jimmy Savile, which underpinned some of the writing of The Wire and the Blood, the book. Um, and I interviewed Savile in the, the late 1970s, and I thought he was a deeply unpleasant man. Uh, I had no basis for that other than, uh, I say, my experience of being in the same room with him and uh, seeing him at first hand. Uh, and then later when I was working in Manchester, we regularly, or regularly, several times over uh, a period of years, people would, would communicate with us, they'd come into the office or they'd phone us and uh, claim to have been abused by, by Savile. But the difficulty was always that it was one person's word against his. There was no corroborating evidence and he was extremely litigious. If there was any big sign at all of us looking into his affairs, we'd get slammed with a, an injunction, we'd get slammed with a, a lawyer's letter. And uh, the other problem I think was that uh, many of the people who had suffered at his hands were damaged people. They were, uh, you know, they were, had problems of, of, of addiction, they had problems of, of mental health. And these were not people you would want to subject to a libel case that even supposing they had had some corroborative evidence, which they generally did not have, you wouldn't have wanted to do that to them. Um, and so it was, it was problematic. The story never got told until Savile was, was dead and in his grave. Uh, and I ended up uh, using some of that in, in, in The Wire and the Blood, which is about the nature of celebrity in, in a wider sense of how celebrity provides a shield for all sorts of behaviour. And I think, you know, when you're writing about issues of violence against women, I mean, you do write about it so sensitively, and as you say, it's with, written with real care, because you're also reflecting maybe the reader's life, and maybe they read it and, and it opens that moment in their head of like, well, this, this is familiar, maybe there's a way out, maybe there's something I can do, and it's, it's so important that we're honest about what happens to women and the experiences that women endure, as you say, day in, day out. We're, it's oh. in the news now, but it's in, in our lives every single day. Yeah, and I've had, uh, over the years, I've had many communications from women who have, have indicated precisely that, that, that reading my, my books has helped them come to terms with uh, things that have happened in their own lives. Um, I, I, I've really not had any of the opposite response. I've not had people saying, uh, you, your books upset me because they, they triggered my own experiences and, and uh, caused me great upset and, and whatever. Um, and, and that's, I'm very gratified to have that response from people because it kind of tells me I'm, I'm, I'm getting it right. Um, and I think it's faintly nonsensical to offer a prize for uh, crime novels that don't have violence against women and children because, you know, like, let's just write about the things that don't happen then. Um, yeah, absolutely. I don't see how you can write crime fiction in today's landscape and not write about 
violence against women because it's everywhere. It's endemic. Um, you know, I know I know a lot of young men die at the hands of others, but there's a different kind of violence engaged in, and it's very often the kind of random violence of of street fighting, uh, of of and 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 of uh, turf wars in a criminal milieu. It's not about being a young man in the world today that causes those murders to happen. Um, and and uh, I think that, uh, as I say, the degree of violence against women in the everyday, in their relationships, in their own homes, is staggering and it's appalling. Uh, and it needs to be dealt with, it needs to be confronted. Uh, and, and men need to take responsibility for this. Yeah, I totally agree. And one way that we can confront it and start to deal with it is talking openly about it and fiction is a way to begin those conversations. But, yeah. you know, we've got, I think last year it was 1.6 million incidents of domestic abuse against women in England and Wales and 86,000 rapes in England and Wales. Like, this is the reality that women are living with day in, day out. And if we can't talk about it, if we can't have an honest conversation about what happens, then we'll never fix it. We'll never, yeah. we'll never challenge it. And those statistics are just the ones we know about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is a whole other issue yeah. around being able to speak and trust. Yeah, I think, um, and I think, I think this is an area where you know people often ask me if, if there's a difference between men writing and women writing and in crime fiction. And I think one of one of the key differences is that every woman has at some point or another felt afraid on the street or in their life. We've all done that thing of walking around down the street late at night and we hear footsteps behind us and immediately we flash forward to what might happen to us, the moment of violence, uh, the moment of sexual violence, the moment of, of just being, being mugged or whatever. Those moments of fear are very real to us. We, we have imagined them, we have, we have lived them in our heads all our lives because as little girls were told, you know, don't be confrontational. Don't go down the dark street by yourself at night. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't wear those clothes. Um, don't be provocative. And we have imagined those situations. We've envisaged them. We've lived through them in our heads. For men, the experience is totally different. You grow up with a different set of expectations from the world. Uh, and men see violence from the outside. Women imagine it from the inside. And I think that that's why much of the, the really powerful writing about violence uh, in, in crime fiction comes from women because we've been there in our heads, if not in our actual lives. Uh, and for, for, it doesn't really happen the same way with men. Some men are, are very different. Some men have had that experience. Um, Mark Billingham, for example, I know was once attacked and, and, and beaten up in his, be his bedroom in the hotel. Um, and people who barged into his room and robbed him so the, when he writes about violence, he writes about it as somebody who knows what this feels like, who knows what that moment of terror is like, where you don't even know if you're going to come out of this alive. But so many men have never been in that place, never had those imaginative moments. And so they write about it differently. Inevitably, you know, there are things I haven't experienced as a woman that a man has experienced. So I don't write about them probably with the same degree of intensity. But when it comes to violence, I think it's something that we do with a particular eye. Absolutely, because it's 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 the water we swim in, and it's that fear, the fear that we are raised with, that as you say, we're we're feeling it from the inside and imagining it from the inside, and even that moment when you're walking home and you're like, do I cut through the park, or do mm. I take the long way around? And it's like that's your constant your constant narrative that's going on in your head because you're imagining what could happen if you cut through the park. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, and, 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 it, and it turns your environment into a, a very, you're looking at your environment through a very different set of eyes. You know, walking through the city in, in daylight is a very different experience from walking through the city at night. Uh, and we, we develop strategies to negotiate those two worlds. So I just have one more question, which is the sort of nice one to end on, I think. So I, what, what's next? What are you, what are you working on now? I'm, is there going to be more Ali Burns or are you looking at a standalone or or just having a break, a much deserved break. <laughs> like, okay. What would I do with my days? What would I do with my days? Um, no, the, the, the 1979 is the first in a proposed quintet of novels that will move forward at 10 year intervals with Ali at the heart of them. 
So um, the next one will be 1989. Uh, I'm planning to, so 79, 89, 99, 2009, 2019. So it'll finish in the last year of normal life because it started as a prompt of COVID because I couldn't write in the present day. Um, so I'm, doing tw I'm, I'm working on the research now for 1989 and thinking about the shape of the story and where it takes me and where it takes Ali. Um, I'm also doing a, a radio drama for Radio 4. I've been commissioned to do a, a radio drama. We're doing a short series of queer dramas uh, next spring. Um, and I'm writing a Miss Marple short story uh, for an anthology that's coming out next September where a dozen writers, a dozen women writers are reimagining Miss Marple uh, and, and giving giving her a bit of the attention that Poirot's had over the years. Uh, Miss Marple was my gateway drug into crime fiction. And so this feels like a, a, a homage to, to her, uh, her wonderful personality and her skills. So those are, that's amongst the things that I'm, I'm doing. Uh, but there's also lots of other bits and pieces along the way. Um, just before lockdown, my partner and I uh, produced a collection of, of very short essays called Imagine a Country, where we asked 99 contributors to, to give us a short take on the one thing that they would like to see in the country they wanted to live in. Uh, and as I said, because it came out right on the edge of, of lockdown, it didn't, uh, didn't get quite the, the level of um, traction that we'd hoped, but it did very well. Um, and we're now doing a second edition of that, which will come out next summer uh, with some new voices added uh, post-pandemic, well, not post-pandemic, as a result of the pandemic. Um, and that'll be a paperback, which I'm, I'm really excited with re-engaging with that because the ideas in that book are extraordinary from really big ideas to change our world to really small ideas that would make a difference in the day-to-day. -day. So it's, it's I, I, I love the fact that um, I've been doing this now for more than 30 years and I've, I've written a lot of books. And so people see me as somebody that might be open to different challenges. And people bring me all sorts of interesting projects to get involved with. And that's very exciting. And it's that, uh, that, that's what feeds my imagination amongst other things. And a writer has to continually feed themselves in order to move forward and, and keep changing. You know, standing still as a writer is, for me, is not an option because I'd get bored, I've got a very low boredom threshold. And I have to keep um, pushing myself and, and, and engaging with the world. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned at the start, if you want to buy 1979 or any of the other books that we mentioned, please do using the link at Storysmith Booksellers, which is a local independent bookseller. So as we've been celebrating them throughout the conversation and just a huge thank you, Val. It was just fantastic. And I feel so many things firing off in my brain and so many ideas and things to think about and things to consider. And Thank you for a fantastic conversation and thank you everyone for watching and being part of the Working Class Writers Festival in collaboration with Bristol Ideas. Thank you.